So we are live on Facebook in the Facebook group Nurses Who Write. So I am super, super excited to be bringing this guest to you all. This is Allison Wearing. Um, before I introduce Allison, I'm just going to introduce myself real briefly. So my name is Rachel. Um, I run this group, Nurses Who Write. I'm very passionate about writing. I'm passionate about um, helping nurses tell their stories and getting nurses writing. And Allison is a best-selling, multiple award-winning writer, playwright, and performer. She is also a memoir writing coach and the creator and facilitator of the amazing program, Memoir Writing Inc., which is an online program that guides people through the process of transforming their personal stories into memoir. So that's a little bit about Allison. She also lives right near where I grew up in Toronto. So we are both fellow Canadians. And I'm just so, so excited to bring Allison to you all. I feel like Allison is just a gift of a human. I have just gotten so much from her resources and she's really just been an inspiration to me and a virtual mentor as well. So I'm just going to start off by having you introduce yourself, Allison, and just tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Rachel. Um... Well, I think I began writing before I could write in that I was one of those kids that just loved stories. I loved being read to. I remember wandering the fields behind my house where I grew up uh, in Peterborough, Ontario, and I was making up titles to these books that I was going to write. I never did the books, but I got a long way with the titles. <laughs> and so I was just always a kid who loved stories. And then that was kind of bashed out of me in school. Um, I didn't, I didn't love English class, for example. In fact, I failed high school English. I failed my grade 12 English and, and never took an English class again, never studied English at university or creative writing or anything. Um, uh, so, so I felt actually very unqualified to become a writer and it came to me quite by accident. I was writing, I was living in um, uh, Czechoslovakia, what was then Czechoslovakia after the revolution. And I had studied politics at university and I wrote a letter to a professor of mine, a former professor, and he wrote back saying, you know, just clean this up a bit and send it to the Globe and Mail newspaper. It's a great piece on post-revolutionary Czechoslovakia. So I did that. And um, but it was it was almost an accident in this in the sense that I didn't I just didn't really see that that path for me, mostly because I just felt unqualified to do that. I loved writing and I wrote copious letters. I was always traveling and writing letters and I wrote to myself constantly. I've kept a journal well for as long as I can remember. Um, and so I always loved sketching with words, I guess. But that piece came out in, in the newspaper. And I remember the byline that said, Alison Waring is a Canadian writer living in Czechoslovakia. And I thought, wow, how did that happen? I became a Canadian writer. <laughs> and then the, I guess that gave me some confidence. And I just, um, I just kept doing that. So my next piece, I traveled to China from there and into the northwestern part of China, where the Uyghur people are that we now hear about this uh, very oppressed um, Muslim minority. And I wrote about, I wrote a piece about that, that that sort of got me on my way. And so these, I started small, I started with little pieces, gradually, they got longer. And they started, some of them sort of won these awards. And, and then I, my first book was about Iran. Um, I had traveled to Iran and just kept this notebook, this tiny notebook filled with details. And uh, that became my first book. And then, um, then my second book was a book about growing up with a gay dad in the 1980s in a small town where dads weren't doing that. <laughs> and, uh, and then my most recent book is another memoir called uh, Moments of Glad Grace. Um, and I started teaching again, kind of by accident. Someone invited me to teach. I didn't, again, feel qualified to teach because I'd never taken a class, but I thought, well, I'll just share my experience. I'll share what's worked for me. And, and I'll listen to people's stories and give them whatever insights I can into what I'm hearing. And, and it turned out to be something that I both really enjoyed and that other people enjoyed, it seemed too. No, we both got a lot out of it. And so that just kept, um, yeah, that sort of snowballed. And I began doing more and more workshops. By then I was performing one woman shows that were also autobiographical. So I would do shows in the evening and workshops in the morning. And, and then I decided at one point, right, I'm going to turn everything I do in person into some kind of online platform because I can only ever work with this small group of people at any one time. 
And, uh, and I did that and that's what Memoir Writing Inc. became. And so since then, that's where most of my creative energy has gone. Mm, oh my God. Okay. I love this. There's like so many like juicy things I want to pull out here, but first of all, my people come from Czechoslovakia. So that's cool. And that's where my grand oh, grandparents okay. were born. Yes. Yes. So I, I noticed that. that. Um, I love that you kind of became a writer by accident. So it's so interesting to me that you failed English. You never took an English class in university. And it's kind of like, it's just such a testament to like what being a writer is. It's not about grammar. It's not about like, I mean, it is, it is about being good with the English language. It is about the craft. It is about writing, but it's about so much more than that. Like what, what drew you to writing? It feels like it was the storytelling piece. It sounds like you were a storyteller from the time that you were a very young child. And then that just kind of evolved. And then the way you described becoming a writer and becoming a writer teacher is what we call in the coaching world, like messy action, like just yeah. like, just kind of like doing it. And it kind of just happened. And it's just, it's so beautiful because it is, it's almost like, um, you just had to follow your calling. You just had to listen to those nudges and just kind of go where things took you instead of just kind of doing what was expected of you. And a lot of what I teach, because I work with a lot of nurses, a lot of nurses are people that put creative dreams aside. And I, I see this all the time. I believe that like 80% of nurses, and this is just a rough number, but are like repressed creatives. Mm -hmm. And this is why I'm so passionate about bringing Julia Cameron to nurses and like unlocking the storytelling and getting back to that create to those creative roots. And so it's just, your story is just such a testament to like, anyone can be a writer. Like you just have to sit down and write. And, you know, and then I also love how when you saw like in the Globe and Mail, you know, and it's like, oh, okay, it's official. I'm a writer now. Um, and I also love that piece because as a high school student, I used to love writing letters to the National Post. That was the newspaper that my parents subscribed to. And I used to write letters to the editor. You know, I had very strong opinions. And so that was my sort of foray into writing. And when I started off as a writer, I was more of like a technical writer. I was really good at writing essays or a little bit more of that kind of writing, but creative writing was so uncomfortable for me. That was just like not my, my, my speed. And now I'm coming back to that. Now I'm like trying to write more stories and narrative writing and voice. And so it's just so cool. Like the, the threads and the way things come together and the way our journeys evolve. And so anyway, your story is just so beautiful. I love it. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. And the, the, there are many ways to many, many paths to writing. And one of them is I do know people, I know writers who studied English and then they did an MFA in creative writing and now they're publishing novels and that's what worked for them. And, uh, but there are so many ways to study writing and to develop a voice and to develop craft. And I guess, you know, just as some musicians are self-taught and others came from, you know, came from piano lessons from age three, we all just come to our own, yeah, our own creative expression in our own way. And mine was a little bit more self-stylized, I guess, um, self-styled um, in that it, it uh, that, that the storytelling, you're right, I was always interested in stories. And the reason memoir is um, something that so many people are drawn to, even if they don't consider themselves writers, they may not ever write a novel, but we all have stories that we have lived and that we've shared with other people. And many people have shared those stories many, many times, and they've crafted the telling of the stories. They're actually better storytellers than they realize because they've been doing it a long, long time. And the voice of the narrator in memoir needs to be our authentic voice. The more authentic it is to our true voice, to who we actually are, the more effective it is and the more readers relate to it and, and become intimate with that character, the narrator. And, uh, and so it can be more, it can be, I think, a more accessible right, uh, form of writing than say poetry or short stories or something something else which isn't to diminish the genre at all i think i think it's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful art form but it's a very specific one within the whole genre of literature and writing yeah yeah it's so beautiful what you just said about kind of like the more authentic the more vulnerable the more personal and detailed you can be the more universally your story is going to resonate and so this is a good time for me to ask you. So there's a, there's a lot of things I have learned from you in your course. One of the things you talk about a lot is details, like really fleshing out details, like even learning the names of flowers, learning the names of plants, like just really fleshing out details. So can you just talk a little bit more about that? Like what is, how, how does filling in detail 
flesh out a story and make it more powerful. Specificity is, yeah, is the is one of the ways that we draw readers into our experience. When we speak in generalities, we're, well, for one thing, we as readers have, have difficulty inhabiting and experience this, that, that is just, it, it makes for an opaque background, but we have no way of inserting ourselves. Whereas when we get into sensory detail, like the texture of the knobs on the cupboard doors that I opened, you know, the moment I learned my, my mother had died, for example, that, that texture, that experience, that sensory detail, we as readers are just boom in the moment having that experience with the reader. Whereas they can talk about the day their mother died in very general terms, in distant terms that allows us to see it, but it doesn't allow us to experience it. And so, so yeah, specificity is one of the, um, yeah, this is really the defining characteristics of effective writing, I think. And, and people, don't often go there. They they tell the stories sort of, they keep us a bit at arm's length. And so that can be one way to just instantly, um, well, I guess, enhance anything you begin you're you're planning to write about. I mean, take the take take your first page and and go sentence by sentence. Is there any way that I can get more specific? It doesn't need to be every single sentence, but it's it's really it's a terrific exercise to go line by line and see can is there any way that I can get closer, that I can move just a step into the experience I'm describing. And so, yeah, that's one thing. And sensory detail, I mean, that that sort of carnal lived experience, that's where emotions are felt. We don't we don't process emotion ideally um, with our heads. We live it in our bodies. And so when we give readers sensory details, we 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 invite them into our lived experience and they begin to have a relationship with both the person narrating the story, but also with the experiences that we're recounting. They are reliving those experiences. Yeah. It's like a gift to your reader. It's almost yeah, like, it's generous. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's almost like a, to use another coaching term, like holding space for the reader because they weren't there. So you're, you're holding that space for them. You're really allowing them to step into that situation with you. And it's, it's generous. That's just a, a beautiful way to phrase it. So, um, yeah, I would love to hear. So another concept that I've learned from you and this, I, I teach my, in my writing course, I borrowed this term from you is the concept of skywriting is huge. And you mentioned this a lot in the course. And so, yeah, I'd love to hear more from you about the concept of skywriting. Sure. Cause that, that's a phrase that I just came up with to describe the, the universal story that is in some ways flying above our personal story because when memoir is done well it, it's not actually about us which seems you know it's it seems like a great it is a great paradox but while while it is a personal story using very personal details from our lives the reason that it resonates memoir is successful or it it, it goes beyond just here's what happened to me it goes beyond that when we realize that our story is but a personal illustration of a larger human story, a larger human experience. And that's what I call the sky writing. It's that larger story that that ours is an expression of. I, and I like to say we don't write about ourselves. We write through ourselves. So we write through ourselves to something greater. And that greater thing is the larger experience, whether it is coming of age, um, you know, surviving heartbreak, um, getting to the other side of grief, um, whatever it might be, the, you know, every human experience is lost. We all experience it slightly differently, but it's something that we, it's it's something that weaves us together as human beings, these shared experiences. And ultimately, ideally, these stories weave us together as human beings. And so, so we are telling our version of the story, but if we're only, if we only have our eye on me, me, <laughs> this is what happened to me, 
the story tends not to have resonance for other people. There's no way in for, for a reader. And, and so we need to remember that every reader is having their own lived experience of our story. And when we can see it, it's almost sort of holographic or archetypal. When we can see the largeness of our story, then we can also begin to understand the shape of it. It's really helpful in so many ways in the writing. So that's something I think that sometimes gets ignored when people talk about memoir writing because it's so often, you know, what happened to me. But the but the thing to remember is it it's not enough what happened. We need to understand why what happened mattered. Why did it matter? And why does it continue to matter? And why should it matter to someone else? Yeah. And sometimes it can be really hard to figure that out. Like, yeah, you know, we don't we, often know at the beginning. In fact, we rarely know at the beginning. But those are the questions we need to be asking along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so powerful. Yes. Yes. I, I use that skywriting concept a lot. I, I, I just, I love that term. It's just, um, yeah, yeah it's thanks. beautiful. Thanks. Yeah. So, okay. Another question I have for you, and this is, um, I love to hear nitty gritty technical on the ground. Like what does your writing practice look like? What time of day do you write? Do you use a computer? Do you use a pen? Like, give me the details. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think of I think it was Elizabeth Gilter, Gilbert who talked about the seasons of writing. I mean, there are some times when we are doing research. There are times when we're actively writing. There are times when we're out in the world, sharing the book, promoting the book, whatever it is. Um, and so I very much see those seasons as well. I'm always writing. I write not every day, but most days in a journal. And that really varies. So that's, I'm very specific about the kind of paper it has to be. I have a fountain pen, a certain kind of fountain pen, a certain kind of ink. I'm really picky about those things uh, because it re it's, a, it's, um, it is a true practice for me. I mean, the sound of the nib against the page is part of it. Uh, I do it early in the mornings with a warm drink in a certain position. Like I'm, I'm very, um, yeah, in that way, I, it's, it's a practice that I, I'm very committed to, but as I say, it's not every day. If I'm traveling, I often will not, you know, I'll, I'll sit in an airport and write with whatever. I have lots of napkins that I end up stuffing into my journals of things that I wrote, but those are, that's my ideal is, you know, that certain kind of pen and paper and, um, but uh, but when I'm then actively working on a project, I'm pretty disciplined. I mean, I do think of it and, and it was it's partly that I I wrote two books with a young child. So or yeah, a child at home. Um, and I mostly so I wrote during school hours, basically. And I would I had an office outside the house. I don't work well in the house, um, even though I had the space to do it. And he was at school. But I would go out to um uh, my last book I wrote in a in a room that the this performing arts lodge in Stratford gave me. Um, and I put my phone downstairs in the bookshelf in the library, uh, tucked it behind some books so that I did not have my phone. I have an app called Freedom, which um, shuts down your shuts down your access to the Internet. And even if you shut down your computer and turn it back on, it still won't access <laughs> turn on the Internet for you. That's a great app. Up. Um, so I would set that for a certain number of hours, generally three hours at a time. I would do three hour chunks. Um, and, and yeah, I started, I would start by rereading what I did the day before. I am definitely not the plow through, write the first vomit draft, you know, don't look backwards. I'm not that kind of writer at all. I sort of wish I were because progress is so much faster that way, but I've always been that, you know, chiseling through stone uh, or chiseling stone and getting to what I'm happy with. And when it sort of feels like it clicks, then I'll move on and it's very slow. Um, so I do edit as I go, but what it means is by the time I get to the last page, more or less the book's done. I mean, I don't go back and do a lot in my first book. I, when I wrote that last scene, it was done. I mean, literally I, in those days it was, you know, printing off paper as you did it and sending the papers in. Um, yeah, there was no looking back and there was almost no, there were almost no changes. I mean, the changes were so minor. It was just, it was, I, I was just this meticulous, meticulous editor along the way. But that, as I say, is a bit hampering in that it means that progress is really slow. And so it can be difficult to feel the kind of gratification that a writer does who, you know, they just, I think, who is it? Stephen King writes, 
Oh, it's something like something crazy, like 5,000 words a day. I mean, uh, 500 words is a great day for me. Yeah, he's prolific. I, I heard he writes for like eight or nine hours a day. It's insane. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I don't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I love, I love, I love hearing this. Like, I love this question because I think you're really exemplifying that there are different ways to write, and you really just have to find what works for you. Like, there's, there's the vomit draft, and then go over after and edit later. There's the edit as you go. There's just different ways to write, and it's really just about finding what works for you. And this is something I really, because I work with so many nurses and I teach the morning pages, I teach the artist sway, I teach about creative recovery at the beginning. I, I love this. It's so predictable. A lot of people are very hung up on like, but Rachel, what time of day, how many pages should I do? Because we're nurses. We love protocols. We love rules. We love check boxes. And I, I'm really trying to help them get in touch with their right creative brain. And a lot of that is like, you know what, it's up to you. Like you want to write in the evening, write in the evening. And that can be scary for some people, because again, we want our check boxes, we want our protocols. And it's just, it's just, I really try to emphasize this, like, make it your own. This is art. This is about being creative. This is about just finding your own path. So I just, I just love that you mentioned those different dynamic ways of writing. It's yeah. And so I actually tried in my last book, I decided, right, I'm going to be one of these productive writers. I'm going to go in and I'm not leaving until I have 800 words. I mean, that's not a lot for a lot of people, but it's a lot for me. So I am not leaving this room until I have 800 words. Even if I have to just sit there and sit there and sit there and sit there, I'm going to do 800 words. So I did that. And, um, and well, one, it was so not fun. It was just, agony it was agony some days agony and um and two I've never had to go back and rewrite so much cut paste change it was a mess I mean I didn't follow my own creative instincts I was taking some idea that being productive was better and I was putting that first and it cost me I mean it really it wasn't it was I will never do that again to myself yeah. Yeah. Listen to your intuition. I think that's yeah. the message there. Love it. Awesome. Okay. I had a couple more questions. Let me see if I can pull them up. We talked about your process. We talked about sky rating. We talked about starting small. Oh, the big one. Okay. So this is a question that I'm sure you've answered a million times, but I would love to hear your perspective on all those fears that come up when we start to think about writing our book. Um, the biggest one is always, what's my mom going to think? I know that's literally in my head all the time. Um, my mom, my dad, my uncle, whatever it is, um, what are people going to think? Am I interesting enough? Who even cares? Why am I doing this? How do we move through those? Because they seem to just kind of always be there in the background and they sen it, it censors us and it kind of shuts us down. So what are your kind of tips and tricks for moving through that kind of thing? Yeah, they're legitimate questions sometimes. I mean, what will my mother think is a very legitimate question. And and so, but it like anything, the more conscious we are of the voice, the the feeling, whatever it is that's shutting it down, the more conscious we are of it, the less power it has over our subconscious anyway. And the and once we're conscious of it, we have now choices. And so so I think that's the first thing is asking the question whose whose voice is that i mean my who cares about my story who whose voice is that i mean who who do you who are you hoping who do you not think is caring about your story who didn't care about your story what what does it actually mean i mean all of our the our lives have value if our lives have value then our stories have value because they are what we have lived and so to just honor that as as a given, I think, is so important that it's it's really that is what the the thing that I think shuts most people down and in memoir anywhere. I mean, I know a lot of people that say, oh, I've led a just crazy life and everybody says I should write a book. But those aren't the best memoirs necessarily. You know, a, a, a horrendous childhood does not a great memoir make. I mean, a lot of memoirs do deal with really difficult childhoods or circumstances, but it's all what we do with what we have. I've read the most beautiful, quiet memoirs that are nothing spectacular, but it's written with grace and wisdom and, you know, and, and an attention to detail and an attention to craft. This person has studied other books. They've, you know, they've made themselves into um, the, the, the best writer that they can be to pen this story. Um, and so, so, 
I think one honoring, honoring that your story matters and that the fact that you have a desire to do this is enough. It means that there's something in you that longs to be born and you don't have to know what it is. You don't have to know who's going to publish it, if it's going to be published, if Oprah's going to like it. You don't need to know anything beyond this is an urge that you have and you can honor that urge. I actually think it's a sacred impulse. This is an honoring of our life and voice. It is is saying, here is who I am and what I have lived. And that is adding a voice to the choir of humanity. And that's a beautiful endeavor in and of itself. The other part about what's my mother going to think or what, what is anyone going to think is you don't need to solve that question right now. In the writing of the story, the story will change. It will not be the story you think it's going to be. That's, I think that we have an idea of the thing we're going to write and rarely, if ever, does it come out as what we think it's going to be. It changes as we write. We then make choices. There are choices that we can make along the way that may answer some of those questions. And those questions are all waiting for us anyway at the end. We don't need to solve them at the beginning. And sometimes it's a matter of some stories have a timing. And some, and some stories, sometimes we can actually um, take people out of stories. Not everybody who lived the story needs to be in the written version of it. Some people can actually just move into the background. There are all kinds, we have a lot more freedom, I guess, is what I want to say, than we think we do. And there are, I always believe the, the biggest obstacle you see in your story is it's is the portal to its highest creative evolution or its, its highest creative expression. In other words, there is a creative solution to your very specific problem that has the potential to make this the strongest and most interesting or most unique part of the telling of this story. There just always is a creative solution if, we, if we're open to it and willing to be creative. So that's that one. And then the last one, yeah, why bother? I mean, <laughs> I ask, I think every writer asks himself this question. I could be just watching Netflix, couldn't I? I don't need to be doing this. And um, it's true. It's really true. You don't need to be doing this and you could not bother. But, but the, um, and that's always an option. The not bothering is definitely an option. But uh, like anything that has value, like anything that sustains and fulfills us and makes life worth living and makes life worth sharing, these things that require of us some, mm, it's not effort, it's commitment. And, and um, actually it's more than that. It's, it's, you know, when it's the, when we let ourselves dance the largest version of us that we can, it is only ever joyful. It is only ever satisfying. It's terrifying and it takes us out of comfort. And sometimes it can cause pain and, and can cause um, disruptions in life. But but when I always have believed that when we act in the service of truth, ultimately, we may cause pain, but we don't cause damage the way that deception mm -hmm. does. And and yeah, there, I, I'm a strong believer in in truth setting us all free in the end. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. I, I loved when you called this like a sacred practice. I got like chills like that's just I don't know just a beautiful reverent way to approach this very difficult task of diving into our own story going to very dark places um just facing things there's something sacred to it because it is you like we each have a risk like not a responsibility but it's like we get to give a testament of our unique life experience and how many people that could inspire and shift and and it's just um, it's just such a beautiful, beautiful way to frame it. I also loved what you said about, um, like not to worry about, you don't have to worry about these questions to start. Like you can get started even with these questions, mm -hmm. like just yeah. move the pen across the page. So no one yeah. is reading the first draft, but you anyway, no one else is seeing it. This is only you and your story. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, safe. That's, and this is why I'm such a fan of the morning pages. Like, it's yeah. like, 
that's a safe place for you to land. Nobody has to see this, you know, and then and part of what I do in my workshop is we start to like, or kind of what we do in, in, actually, I don't know if there's writing in your group, but like when you write in a group or if you write with a partner, you're starting to like grow that container of safety. So we're starting with the morning pages. No one has to see that. That's just private for me. And then we start to get to know ourselves and all these themes start to rise to the surface and these old memories and these repressed dreams. And then we, we learn how to start sharing that in a way that we feel comfortable sharing with a larger and larger group. And that's, those are the stepping stones I feel like to writing a book or writing an article or, or sharing on a larger scale. So yeah. 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 yeah beautiful. Okay. Amazing. Um, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about your group um, your, your writing course, which I have taken. I'm a huge fan. I have learned so much. I've made amazing connections. Actually, I just told Allison before we got on this call that I met someone in one of the writers unite groups, which is like a, so like a writer social hour. And she's coming to visit me in a few months from New Zealand. She's coming all the way to Los Angeles to visit me. So I've made some great friendships. Yeah. yeah. It's just, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful course. It's just packed with gold with lots of good information. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to just give you an opportunity to talk about it and, and share it with the group. Thanks. Thanks. So, um, yeah, this is what I created when I was trying to take what I was doing live with people around the table and make it available to people anywhere. So it's a 12 week program and, uh, and it's, um, yeah, it's a combination of ideally lively videos, inspiring videos. And, and there's, so there are interviews with authors, there are suggested readings and then exercises, prompts that get you writing in different ways, but also with an eye to finding out, you know, pulling out the story that you are really interested in writing. Um, it does not guarantee that you have a book at the end of 12 weeks. I mean, there's that, that is absolutely not the guarantee, but it is a, it is a map through this terrain of memoir. And what I, what, the way that it started was that I kept being asked a similar set of questions by people, whether they were rank beginners or experienced writers, the same series of questions and obstacles seemed to appear to people. And that fascinated me at first. And so I, I, so I structured the course that way, that those things that are going to come up for you, here are the best answers that I have or ways through or ideas for how to solve this or get your, get yourself through that. Um, so it's, it's a, it's the, 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 there's the course part, but then there's also, as Rachel said, there's a live event each month, one of which is a Writers Unite, which is um, an opportunity to meet other people in the program, find a writing partner. Some people form writing groups. Some of these writing groups have published anthologies together. It's so fun, just what has come. And yeah, stories like yours of writing partners who've who've now been trading chapters of books and one's getting one published. And uh, it's just really fun to see. So um, yeah, so it's a combination of live Q&As that the the opportunity to meet other writers. And then you have lifetime access to the material that was really important to me because not everyone just buzzes through a course at the same rate. So I wanted to make sure people could go back and when they needed it, when is it, when and as they needed the to review things. Some people go through it twice. In fact, I lead um, writing retreats now in Italy, mostly in Tuscany, and uh, a group that was there are all restarting the course together in January. January. So they've all done the course. Now they're going through it again together and they're going to meet every two weeks and keep each other accountable. So, you know, there are just so many ways of doing it, but it's, um, yeah, it's been terrific fun. I love that. And I, that was my impulse as I was going through your course. Like I was like, I'm totally going to start this over and do it again uh, because it's so rich. Like there's just, it's like dark, dark chocolate. Like it's rich. <laughs> there's so much in there and there's writing prompts and just thought provoking questions. It's, it's just packed with goodness. So I encourage everybody to check it out, take a look. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on with me today, Allison. This is oh, just, pleasure. I'm, pleasure. yeah, I'm just, I'm really honored. I'm really just, you, you really, really inspire me. And I'm sure you've heard that many times, but you're just, you're really an inspiration to me. You really have encouraged me to write. Thanks to your course. Actually, I submitted for the Amy awards. Hey, that was my fantastic. first time. Yeah. That was like my first time polishing and completing a piece mm -hmm. and submitting it. And like, I didn't win, but it felt so good. It felt so good to complete a piece. And that's another thing you talk about in the course is 
we don't have to start with a book, you know, start with these smaller pieces, build that confidence and that snowballs and becomes the book. And so you really inspired me to, to complete that piece, to submit. I'm going to continue to be submitting. I'm just, I'm going to go back and dive back into the course. I've learned so much from you. Um, is there any last, that makes me so happy. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank Allison. You. Yeah. Are there any last words of wisdom or something you feel that's really on your heart that you want to share with the group before we hop off? Mm. Well, I suppose one of the things that I love doing is celebrating voices that until now have been quiet. Um, in other words, many of the people who come to do the course have not had a writing career. They've not put their voice out there. They've not often told the stories that are most meaningful to them. And to see this as an opportunity for them to do that. And then to amplify those voices, to see these people, you know, some people are now getting published or getting book contracts and, um, or just sharing these stories with family and friends. Someone just created a beautiful Christmas gift for all of her children and grandchildren, a series of these stories that she's written. You no, know, it, 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 that um yeah that's hugely gratifying and so valuable i guess i guess and i'd love to just be an example of someone who failed english <laughs> i still <laughs> <laughs> you could be a writer we become writers by writing maybe that's what i want to say yeah uh, okay i think that's a beautiful beautiful place to finish um, if anyone wants to find Allison, you can just Google her name, Allison Waring. Everything should be there. Um, and thank you again for coming on in this group. I'm super, super appreciative. And uh, Thanks, I'm gonna, you're welcome. And I'm going to hit the stop streaming. <laughs>